Hello and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan. Episode 16. My guest is an author, freelance writer, and cruciverbalist. That last word might be unfamiliar to you, so allow me to explain. A cruciverbalist is a person skilled in the art of creating and solving crossword puzzles, which is something that David Astle has been doing for most of his life. Since the mid-1980s, he has been crafting cryptic crosswords for readers of Fairfax newspapers, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, but for most of that time, he was known only by his initials. It wasn't until 2010 that D.A. exposed himself as David Astle with a book named Puzzled, Secrets and Clues from a Life Lost in Words. All of my guests on penmanship share a love of words and language, but David Astle might take the cake in this regard, if only because when we met at a hotel room in late November, he was wearing a shirt which read, Triple Nerd Score. David is also unique among my guests thus far to have co-created a new word. In 2012, he was part of a team which met at Sydney University to come up with a definition for the act of snubbing someone in a social setting by looking at your phone instead of paying attention. Their creation? FUB. A phone snub. P-H-U-B. For years, I have enjoyed David's column Wordplay, which appears in the Sydney Morning Herald art section, Spectrum, each Saturday. It was through this narrow window into his long and prosperous freelance career that we met while he was visiting Brisbane to promote his first book for kids, Word Burger, How to Be a Champion Word Puzzler in 20 Quick Bites. As I soon learned, however, David is a man who carries many arrows in his writerly quiver, and it was a delight to discuss how he has built a life around a love for language. Our conversation touches on the challenge of writing for children instead of adults, how he chooses timely topics for his weekly column, how he became obsessed with puzzles as a teenager and began stalking a prominent Fairfax puzzle editor, the interview that led to him quitting his one-time dream job as a feature writer for Inside Sport, and how he became the host of a television show on SBS named Letters and Numbers. Introducing David Astle, author, freelance writer, and cruciverbalist. David Astle, welcome. Thank you. You had an event here in Brisbane last night, uh, a launch of your children's book, Word Burger. How did that go? It was fantastic. Uh, there were about uh, 30 or 40 people, and uh, I got everyone up on their feet, and they performed the alphabet. It was a bit like YMCA, but with 22 other characters involved. How did you come across that strategy of getting them on their feet to do the alphabet? Uh, I think if you want to be... Um, inspiring you need to be kinetic particularly with kids Mm -hmm. you can't be chalk and talk but this is all very much beta testing because it's um, fresh fields for me I haven't done a kids book before Mm. but really it's been long overdue because there's something about me that is very childlike in the way that I think so it seemed uh, seemed a book I had been meaning to write for the last 15 years your idea or a publisher came to you no it was my idea but it was engineered or inspired by a lot of comments I was getting uh, at book events and festivals by people asking me, is there a kid's version of Puzzled? Mm. And the short answer was no, and the longer answer is now there is. Are you happy with it? I'm delighted. Did you, you worked with an illustrator, I'm, I'm assuming? I did, yes, and uh, so that was important too. As Alice says, what's the use of a book without pictures? And I did want it to be more of a, a, a fun book that was also a manual rather than a manual that happened to be fun. Hmm. So I didn't want to put words like guide or manual on the cover. There is how to, hmm. um, but ultimately it's learning cryptic crossword skills by stealth with a lot of games along the way. A design with fun in mind. Fun in mind, and, but also skills with a, with a Z. Did you test it on any young folk for publication? <laughs> I did. A precocious young uh, uh, boy called Liam who had a go and um, he loved it. But I, then I thought, well, because he's precocious, I should be a little more circumspect. So I tried it on um, other kids and uh, there were positive signs mm-hmm. that, it, that the penny was dropping with a lot of them. 
Did you have to do any uh, revisions or change things based on how those children interacted with the book? I did, and it made me realise that uh, some of my stories were either a bit too internal or too cognitive. And part of the challenge and the joy of writing for kids is to make things far more visual. And to give you an example of that, uh, I was talking about um, how texting is, uh, how that's influencing our language. And rather than setting about on some, you know, brainiac essay on the topic, I recall an incident with my daughter and uh, our sick cat where texting was involved. And that's the way you've got to write in general, but certainly for kids. You, you need to tell stories and things need to be tactile and visual. Hmm. Did you have to? Did you find that you had to reduce some of your uh, propensity to strong and difficult, complex language when writing this book? Yeah, that was probably the hardest part, actually. And <laughs> just to uh, suddenly not not to not to play dumb or down, but to to play totally fair and at a beginner's grade. Hmm. Uh, so the clues are still slippery, and the language is still uh, has its own evasions within it. But there's certainly I'm playing to a to a much younger, fresher audience, and I don't want to intimidate them with too much chicanery. Is it in, entirely aimed at children, or is it the kind of book that you hope parents will read alongside their children? A uh, very shrewd observation, Grasshopper. That's not what I'm really. Uh, I think this is where Wordburger could actually uh, enjoy a, a kind of double demand because it is that book that actually parents may buy for for their kids or for nieces and nephews. Um, but in the end have a sneak read themselves or maybe just pick it up off um, the bedside table because really it is um, a simpler illustrated version of Puzzled which is also the crossword manual Mm. but you know with far more expansive ambit. What are you hoping to achieve with this book and your your previous books? Is there an overarching theme or message that you're trying to put out there in the world? Well I suppose I've written something like a dozen books and it's really been the last six of those that have been drilling the the vein of wordplay. So that to me, I I suppose my subgenre has been found, my sweet spot has been found. Mm -hmm. And the market has responded to in that that, that's uh, an area that I cover reasonably well and people have been responding to. So for years I was almost a a writer in search of a genre Mm. and I think even though I don't want to limit myself to wordplay entirely, um, always looking for other projects and other ideas, I'm very happy with this particular vein of of writing. Is there much competition in this field in Australia? In Australia, not not so much. I mean, look, there are some some fine writers out there doing great things with words. Um, Ursula uh, Dubarovsky, who did Word Spy, they're fun books and kids really responded well to them. So part of the challenges of Wordberger was not to write uh, a sequel to, to Ursula's books. Mm. Um, in uh, the UK, it's it's much more of a tradition, you know, with wordplay and parlor games being more prominent as a uh, preoccupation or cultural, you know, touchstone. But in Australia, uh, I think it's a I'm a little bit of a um, both pioneer and um, and kind of sole trader. A unicorn. <laughs> a unicorn, yeah, they exist. <laughs> I missed the arc, but I'm still mucking around on a, on a narrowing piece of land. Well, congratulations on your career so far. I, I'm coming to you from quite a narrow uh, understanding of your work, which is through your column in Spectrum, mm-hmm. Wordplay. How did that come about? Well, that was a, a delightful outcome of um, uh, an, a negotiation with uh, Fairfax about six years ago where I wanted a little more job security, I suppose, or uh, a little more um, uh, an established role with the paper. And uh, part of that negotiation was a column. It was, um, it was always just on a let's see how it goes uh, prospect, but uh, six years later I've really enjoyed doing that every week and, um, and have had fantastic feedback and, and more and more sort of followers and mail and um, uh, responses so everything's looking very um, you know optimistic and, and positive with that column. It's about 500 words I'm guessing? Uh, closer to it's about six, 650. Okay mm-hmm. how do you how do you fill that each week do you have like a backlog of ideas that you're 
summoning or do you kind of start with a blank slate each time no it's always I look I suppose a time hook is uh, is preferable so if I see something in the news that uh, I, I can expand upon um, for example I do remember uh, Tony Abbott's use of the word Holocaust about a year ago so that might be a, a launching pad or uh, perhaps the um, you know with emojis being prominent uh, due to their winning of the so-called word of the year so I then delve into emojis Don Watson's book comes out worst words so I, I comp a copy of that and go you know snorkeling through that and find some fantastic words that then uh, you know cascades into non-words and nonsense words but then again I do have a backlist um, and that that's a really uh, important thing for a columnist to have um, these aren't pre-written columns these are just more timeless ideas that I would like to explore such as someone emailed me in fact two people have emailed me in the last um, three months saying could you do something on reduplicatives and they are the words like harem scarum and higgledy piggledy and wishy-washy where have they come from why do humans need to repeat things and why do so many start with h so clearly not a pressing issue but on a slow news week look out for you know uh harem scarum possibly that's related to politics as well the need to repeat things <laughs> yeah well certainly a lot of jiggery pokery and uh you know uh, uh you know other kind of bunkum goings on in, uh, in politics how long do you spend on those wordplay columns each week, roughly? Um, I usually d devote a, um, uh, a, f a Friday morning to doing them. Uh, that's to submit for the following week. So I write them on a Friday, uh, let them distill on a, um, across the weekend, give them a closer read on the Monday morning and hand it in 10 o'clock for that weekend's um, paper. Um, some uh, take a lot more research than others um, and that's okay that's sort of part of the part of your brief some might be entirely visceral uh, or entirely whimsical uh, or maybe even a, um, a compilation of of mail that you've received that kind of creates a nice pastiche hmm. but generally um, it takes it takes the better part of say two and a half hours to compose and then another hour give or take of just reflecting and distilling and, and finessing. Are you a good editor of your own work? I think I am and I, it is that um, because there's the teacher in me. Mm. So I used to teach creative writing and journalism and I always warn students, young writers against the, um, that postnatal glow. While it's good to be positive about your writing, you shouldn't be too easily impressed by your stuff. <laughs> so yeah, I, I am I, I, I do have quite a, a basilisk eye when it comes to rereading my stuff. What about your editor? Does she come back with, I think it's a she, Louise? Yeah, Susan Wyndham. Oh, I, I, Susan, I, of course. I can't speak more highly of Susan. She's been <coughs> terrific. And in fact, um, Jason Steger, who's filling in for Susan, as much as I value both their editors, there's, uh, there's just something that's, um, maybe she's grown up with the column, Susan. Um, she's away currently for the next six weeks. Mm -hmm touring the, uh, the archipelago of Indonesia and I just hope that she remains safe because she's such a, a dear friend of the column and a great um, sounding board and critical reader. So it's been going about six years. Mm -hmm. How has that changed your career in, in any measurable way? Uh, I suppose it has made me a more legitimate um, uh, wordsmith rather than just a puzzle maker because other people in the past have just perceived me as being either uh, an anagram meister, such as um, the letters and numbers role uh, fulfilled, or a puzzle maker with all the crosswords and the recent rash of puzzle colored books. But uh, this column, which is you know, more, far more about exploring language or separate from, from wordplay, I think has given me uh, a a, a more justified mantle of being uh, a word nerd. You do like to refer to yourself as a word nerd, don't you? I do. I, I, in fact, I've got a t-shirt that says triple nerd score. You do? I, I'm loud and proud about it. It's fantastic. I, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to speak to you, mm. to you for this program, which is all about writing culture and how people have created careers around this craft. Well, in fact, getting back to the Word Burger launch, that was a message I really wanted to pass on to these absolutely meteoric 
young kids, late primary, all of them so sharp-minded and so loving of language that I just wanted to say that it is a totally wonderful appetite to keep wetted and uh, to, to keep fed all through your lives. It, it, um, it's so rewarding and it's uh, so exciting the places it can, le- it can lead. Has having the weekly column forced you to keep more of an eye out for things in the world or in the news which are around language in particular? Well, funnily enough, it's actually another role I fulfilled during the week which has made me more of a, a, news, uh, a news feeder. I've always been quite plugged into current affairs. Uh, um, you know, I subscribe to you know, numerous news sites and, and papers. I'm, I am a news consumer, but, but I've been looking much more critically due to the Radio National job that I have, which is where I, every week, mix up a news event, news topic, headline into an anagram. Mm. And uh, for example, what's the next example? Um, well, with Port Darwin um, about to be uh, sold or leased to Chinese interests, um, I thought, well, that's Port of Darwin lease and that's something like depot for sale in war. So I, I'm always looking for something to manipulate into, you know, an opposite anagram. So that, in combination with the wordplay column, definitely I've had to keep a, you know, a, a weather eye on what's uh, evolving in the news. Do you enjoy that constant engagement, or does sometimes become a bit overwhelming? It does get a little bit wearing after a while. In fact, I look forward to the weeks that I can have off, if that's possible, to just to switch off and and almost uh, disconnect to reconnect, as they say. Hmm. How do you uh, source those anagrams? Do you, do you run them out by hand or do you use a computer generator or something? Both. Look, what I do is um, I, I suppose where my bent or skill lies is I can spot within a, um, a phrase words that will relate to um, the event itself. Uh, so I can say, I can look at Michael Clark and think that's so close to cricket, I just need to add a T. So if I put in captain, then that gives me the, the missing T. So I'm almost like a, a chef where I know that if I want to get that overall piquant effect that I need to add beetroot as well as a little bit of ginger. <laughs> where did that skill come from? I think that's... That's hard. It's hard to actually, you know, I can't say a day when I suddenly <laughs> looked at um, Balgala and realised there was an owl nesting inside the suburb. But I, I do know that it's been, it's been a constant companion. Um, and when I was uh, lucky enough to interview Geoffrey Rush, we discovered, and I discovered, that he actually is, has phonesthe- you know, phonesthe- synesthesia, that when he looks at a script, Everything is shaded and coloured into different uh, um, tones. And I think there's something about the way my brain is wired that when I see a word, um, I can see it as being this um, moldable entity. I I don't see anything as being fixed. Hmm. So I I think it's almost like when I see the letters, they they almost flex and shimmer. That's extraordinary. It's, It's just, in fact, I may well be kidding myself, but a it's I can't say it's an early memory, but I when I saw recently a, a, a baby bottle feeder, I noticed there were embossed letters on the side. And I swear as a, a, a newborn when I was on the formula or mum's express milk, that there was part of me that was just brailing the embossed letters with my fingertips. I just was hooked on letters even before I knew what they were. Wow. Tell me about the house or the household where you grew up. Well, it was in Balgala, um, which is uh, just a sort of above Manly Beach, really, northern beaches of Sydney. And uh, it was wonderful to grow up because Dobroyd Point Park, which overlooked the sweep of Sydney Harbour, had a, uh, a five-storey iron rocket you could climb. And uh, it just felt like you were perched in the, the, the area of the world. So that was my upbringing, you know, mucking around in that area until I was about five, almost school age, and then over to French's Forest, which was just as wild and wonderful. 
full of bush as it was then and that's where I suppose my imagination was just um, let loose with bike riding and wars and pirate games and yeah we were Birkin wheels heading off into Oxford Falls wilderness <laughs> leeches tadpoles frogs everything that you know the modern child generally doesn't do were there a lot of books in your house growing up there, there were a lot of books mum was a very keen reader she devoured a Patrick White every summer and we had encyclopedias the Billabong series lots of dictionaries um, mum was a, a crossword solver and my uh, her mother so there was, uh, I suppose, the, yeah, that was a family home that was built of love and language. You were encouraged to read from a young age. Yeah, very you, much. You weren't mm-hmm. discouraged. No, never discouraged. And, all, and also really uh, lots of um, bedtime stories as well. So, and that's which I've tried to continue with my kids when they were young. It's so important. What did your parents do for work? Uh, Dad was a sea captain and uh, he was... Um, he wasn't at home for the first year or two when I was growing up, so like obviously he was home enough. But um, I did have um, mum and uh, my godmother, who was mum's friend, were almost like my prime carers for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Dad was then uh, constant for um, about three onwards, and mum, her job was uh, an occupational therapist. She was a full-time mum for with four kids, and then she returned to that career when. Um, when the kids were a bit older. When you started school, were you more well-read than others? Or, or not particularly? Uh, I think I just had a, um, a native intelligence for, for language. I don't know if I was better read. I, I suppose, and I, I think I, I certainly had a sharper appetite for words. And I do remember lots of teachers giving me um, advanced books or extra books to, to devour. Mm. And I remember there was a thing called the S, I think it was called the SRA reading series. And um, I got to silver pretty quickly, which I think there was silver and gold were at the end. <laughs> and a lot of my mates were around, still around the pastel colours. But I was up there with all the girls, because the girls are usually smarter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm interested in that early reading experience, because possibly I'm projecting. Mm-hmm. My father was and is a teacher librarian. Right. So from a very young age, he was bringing home buck loads of books and my brother and I devoured them wonderful so that I think that is a huge part of why I am in this career now Mm -hmm. where I I love words and work with them it's um there's no doubt it's uh, that's what I was trying to establish with the kids you know even if you go off and do different things to just have a bed of language have this really strong sense of narrative and and what words can do and the power of words it, it it just um enables you to use a modern word you know into whatever tangent you take but communication is just there waiting for you to to excel in if you have that background were you a good student yeah i was actually i was rambunctious as a primary schooler always getting into trouble for for fights and being you know too chatty and those two things are related Mm -hmm. because i was always a little bit unguarded with my comments um then in um Then I was thrown into a a kind of posh boys school, almost from the bush, and I felt a little bit out of place for the first year, but it didn't take me long to to fit in um, and find subjects that I really liked and and, excelled in them. I suppose English and history were the two obvious ones. Did you have career ambitions as a a young boy or as an adolescent? Uh, I did, and... I don't think any of them really came to pass. I, I always had writing as a, uh, a love. I don't know if I wanted to be a writer full stop. I think that was probably a little bit quixotic. And even then I realized it was. But I did like the idea of being a sports writer because I loved sport as a kid. I still do as an adult. It's one way I can switch off with language. So I was doing, that's where I was tending and trending. Uh, and then that went off to do communications and sports writing was pretty quickly lost its luster compared to other more creative careers. Mm-hmm. Communications at university? Yeah, UTS in Sydney. Uh-huh. How was that course? Did you enjoy it? I did because it was, um, it was free range. It was very um, loose-limbed and, uh, and relaxed. And, you know, I came in there as this... Um, 
uh, is kind of vanilla boy from the burbs with uh, a real Protestant study ethic. And suddenly was shocked to see uh, women with purple hair and um, piercings and lecturers who were arrested for, you know, Vietnam moratoria. And I thought, wow, this the world's a big and wonderful place. What year are we talking when you started? Uh, so that would be 19, early 80s, so 1980 to 82 is when I did uh, communications. And uh, I, I think it really healthily um, slapped me and unhinged me into, you know, different um, way of thinking. What were you reading at that point in your life for, for pleasure? Um, two writers that would seem as though they're at odds with each other, and they are Nabokov and, and Updike. I think Updike was, was my suburban self still trying to make sense of um, what was going on around me. And uh, uh, Nabokov was my, you know, intellectual wordy um, side that was, you know, was an emigre and exotic and, and strange and opaque, which I think related to what I was experiencing at, on campus. Were books a very private thing for you up until that point, or did you start to meet people who had similar tastes to you? Uh, no, I, th- I, th- I still think it was a private... I mean, I had friends at the UTS course who, who were keen readers, and a lot of keen writers. So we, we tended to share a lot more about what we were writing. But reading was, you know, I was aware of, of Catherine being into Simone de Beauvoir. I was aware of, you know, Barry being into um, beat poetry. You know, you're sort of aware of what people were reading, but you didn't necessarily analyse the, the stuff that they were going through. How were you as a university student? Uh, I was, um, I, I think I was probably a bit... Uh, brash um, but then and, and, and also that was knocked out of me too because there were some very articulate and ferocious people on campus um, but where I found my um, my comfort zone was actually in the student um, press because uh, I then became funnily enough the, the sort of puzzle and um, I, I created a puzzle page in the student rag mm. and also found myself being a movie critic and a, um, a kind of comedy and language writer. Also a cartoonist for about six months until I realised I couldn't draw. A man of many talents, <laughs> or attempted talents. Yeah, that's right. Master of none. <laughs> well, where did the puzzling come from then? You can't just decide one day, I'm going to create a puzzle page. You must have had interest before that. Yeah, I did. And um, I think, in fact, looking back at um, the last few books I've read, I've come to understand that my first love in terms of word wordplay was um, was riddles, and then what riddles are are a kind of friendlier version of what a cryptic crossword uh, can be. That is, it's an evasive language with a, a a preloaded answer. It's very much what a riddle is. So the transition from riddling into puzzling was actually pretty smooth, and I'd always enjoyed just you know, things like simple anagram puzzles and things as a seven to, you know, to 12 year old, just those sorts of word games I've always loved. Um, so I then found myself getting into puzzles and cryptic puzzles in my early teens and then became obsessed about puzzles because I do find them so deeply satisfying and um, subversive. And then that uh, led me into subscribing and chasing down a particular American magazine called Games uh, that no longer exists, but when it did, it was just iconic. It had the, um, the pantheon of US puzzle makers, you know, cutting their, uh, cutting their shapes with some really innovative uh, puzzle ideas, both visual and verbal and graphic. And so it just became this wonderful subculture. And while I had my crossword debut at high school by composing a crossword that was distributed around the school, I had my puzzling debut really at, um, at university through the student press. You were obsessed with puzzles. How did that manifest itself? Well, it, it manifested itself into a series of um, uh, really annoying letters that uh, Fairfax <laughs> received, and they were right across the road from where UTS were at that stage at Broadway. And I just uh, pretty much stalked the um, 
the puzzle editor. Um, that sounds a very august title. Uh, he was actually he had about five roles, the poor bloke. Um, and uh, but I just sent them continually these undergrad puzzles and um, crosswords. I eventually got a break there in 1983 as a crossword maker, and then it was about a year later that I got a break as a, a the word wit puzzle maker, which is the daily word puzzle that appears in the Fairfax papers and has done for something like 30, 33 years, 35 years. Hmm. Every day I make a word puzzle. Wow. Yeah. So. No repeats. <laughs> this podcast is really a confessional. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated by how you are stalking the puzzle editor. Did, at what point did you meet that person? This is a remarkable uh, coincidence. Uh, it's something I talk about in Puzzled. Um, his name was Ron. I'm just trying. I'm fishing around for his surname because I haven't thought about uh, Ron for a while. He was a lovely bloke, but I only knew him as as Ron in all these correspondence. I'd never met him. And on the weekend, I played uh, rugby with uh, a local team, and uh, we had this bloke who came along as a referee in the lower grades, and uh, he was short. He had a, a kind of brill creamed comb over. He had ashtray glasses. He was um, always uh, gasping for breath. Uh, he was the referee. Um, and, of course, it ended up being Ron. I had no idea. So when I eventually met Ron in the foyer of Fairfax, he and I looked at each other and we kind of went, you! And I went, you! Because I gave him so much grief on the field uh, for his decision-making. And, then, um, uh, and of course, he knew me just from being such a, a, you know, a brash loudmouth. And he didn't realise that I was the same person uh, stalking with the puzzles but we also realised that um, yeah we had a lot in common in that we both enjoyed our football and uh, yeah we also had been developing this love-hate relationship for, for years without realising we knew each other. He became a mentor? No Ron didn't but Ron actually opened the door to Lindsay Brown who was the crossword um, yeah, kind of emperor of, um, of the day. He, he made um, the crosswords for Fairfax and even for the Daily Telegraph mm. almost every day and was a, a, an absolute polymath, you know, was such a, a genius of a man. And um, I had been solving his crosswords for many years and then Ron played matchmaker and Lindsay and I, we only met formally once but we had this, you know, 18 months of correspondence um, and just by chance I happened to teach his daughter at, uh, when I was a student teacher and I've since come to uh, get to know his, um, his widow very well through writing Clutopia and writing Puzzled. Mm. So he's been a very important part of my life even though I've only sat down with him and, and shared a pot of tea once. Wow. Mm. So you got a break in 1983 in Fairfax to do crossword. Mm -hmm. What was that process of, of pitching a crossword as it were? Uh, well, it was uh, elongated because um, my early stuff was, was not fit for publication. There was too many in-jokes or uh, rule-breaking clues. And Lindsay recognised that and gently cajoled me about how to play fair. Hmm. Uh, so I suppose it was this... It would have been something like 18 months of um, correspondence and revision. Uh, and eventually when the... Um, when the light went green, it was only on a, a, a probation uh, kind of understanding. It was just to see how uh, the puzzle was received, and it was never a, a weekly gig. It was just a sporadic gig. But I suppose the, you know once I did learn to behave, and also once people learnt to understand my wavelength, which is an important part of mm. puzzle solving, then. Um, you know, more regular place was found. So I'm not a crossword, uh, I don't fill out crosswords, I don't mm -hmm. do puzzles, so I'm, I'm completely clueless in this area, more or less. Tell you gave yourself away by saying fill out, you solve, you didn't <laughs> fill them out. Indeed, indeed, there you go. What is a rule-breaking clue in a crossword? What does that mean? Uh, okay, well, a cryptic crossword clue is made up of two parts, and uh, one part needs to be the definition, and the other part needs to be the wordplay. So, for example, uh, a clue might be, um, what was one? 
I was trying to think of one that uh, really illustrates the point well. So if I said uh, a strange lump on fruit, then when you treat lump strangely, you get plum, which is a fruit. So that's an anagram clue. So the first part there is the wordplay, anagram, and the other part is the definition, fruit. Mm. But if, if you said something like, if you played unfair, you would say something like, uh, strange protuberance on fruit. And what you're asking the solver to do is to think of a synonym for protuberance, lump, then to mix it, plum, there's your fruit. That's actually unfair. Hmm. It's called an indirect anagram and then no no. So that's kind of rule breach number one. There's about 10 breaches. Uh, others are using a homophone instead of a, a definition or, or providing two wordplay elements instead of a definition uh, or, or even providing a clue that is essentially an orthodox clue but parading as wordplay. All these things are pushing the niceties. And uh, puzzlers or solvers hate this sort of thing? Well, I belong in the camp called the Libertarians and they are the ones who are the more inventive. Which is not to say you've got license to, um, to, to scorn the rules. But in my understanding, it does give you license to test the elasticity of rules. Uh, and to know when you've actually trespassed, and people will tell you. Um, and t- to wonder if you've offended the majority or only the minority. Because in the end, you'll offend <laughs> plenty of people. But whether it's, you know, uh, whether that plenty is, is a plenty too much. <laughs> But I do, I do actually like a lovely clue that I came across that wasn't mine, but was um, uh, a rat race. That was the clue, a rat race. And the answer is half marathon, because half of the word marathon is a rat. So it's a very beautiful clue, because it's playing around with the idea of the hustle and bustle of a city. Mm. But it's also, there's something that's, that is uh, geometrically perfect about the clue too. But others have complained about a clue like that, saying it's a bit incomplete. Um, there's no verb. It's things like that. It's, I, I, I find that really um, kind of asphyxiating, that kind of you know, pedantry. <laughs> How soon into your crosswording or puzzling career did you start receiving reader correspondence or uh, puzzler correspondence? Well, probably, probably the day that they started identifying the setter by using the byline. Because up till then, they were a generic product called the Fairfax crossword. But it was only in the, I think it was in the early 90s. I don't have a precise year, but I'm guessing early 90s when they started um, subscribing the grid with uh, an initial. So up popped DA and all the other compilers. And I think once people realized that there was essentially a culprit, uh, that that then the correspondence began. By the same token, I received plenty of, I, I still, I continue to receive plenty of positive mail, mm. but uh, there's always people, even this week, you know, having some issue with a clue that you've done. Do you respond? I do, yeah. Unless, uh, unless something is particularly noxious and, um, uh, and really quite vitriolic uh, and personal, you know, like when people want to get personal about it, uh, then no, I usually just, you know, I, I treat that a bit as kind of troll, mm. as troll sort of like. When did DA become David Assel in, in public? When did you first get that full byline or where? Uh, well, for a long time I was, um, there were two entities. There was DA on the puzzle page and then there was David Astle, um in the uh, Inside Sport magazine, Sunday Life magazine, Rolling Stone magazine. There was, you know, I was producing novels. So David Astle and DA were, were two separate people. Mm-hmm. But when the two merged was um, when it was the perfect storm of um, in about 2010, I suppose, really, uh, when Letters and Numbers was launched. Uh, I was identified as being David Astle, the, the crossword bloke. And that was also the same year or thereabouts that Puzzled came out which was my coming out book saying, yes, I am a word nerd and I do have a green lycra, um, you know, sort of onesie with riddles all over it and I'm <laughs> proud of it. So right. that was my, um, that was my 
self-acknowledgement of my sort of secret career. So you were in the shadows for quite a while then? Quite happily. Look, there's something about anonymity that is um, worth protecting. Yeah. But in the end, I, I think in the same way that I've been doing those wordplay books now for about six years, that coincides with the recognition, my recognition, that it is what I do and it's what I've always loved. So why not share it to a wider, with a wider audience? and fuse the two entities together, that is DA and myself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's who I am. Um, uh, And while that has created um, (laughs) quite a bit of surprise in some people, because I am either articulate or or genial, um, it's also, I, I think it has brought a lot more people to my work and my puzzles. What happened after university? Uh, I basically went travelling for a long time. Worked on cargo ships for about six months. Doing what? Uh, I was just a spare parts, you know, navvy. Through my dad, there was an opportunity that cropped up. You worked with your dad? No, I didn't work with my dad, but he um, teed up some work on Norwegian ships. Hmm. I did that in my mid-twenties. Early twenties, I actually stuck uh, with rugby. I did a, a rugby trip of Europe. I was very keen about rugby as a young man. What did you play? I was a flanker and sort of played Gordon, you know, just Gordon club grade, but loved it. Um, and then I lived overseas, you know, spent time in six months in Italy and Spain, wrote novel that came shortlisted for the Miles Franklin when I was only 21 mm. and thought, gee, you know, novel writing, that's a pretty easy career. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but What was the name of that novel? Uh, that was called Marzipan Plan. Mm-hmm. I want to hear more about ship life, working on mm. ships. What, yeah. Tell me, what do you recall? What do you when you think of that time? What comes to mind immediately? Uh, prison. Yeah. Mm. It was a floating prison, because you have this uh, uh, finite population of men, and everyone has their own scheme and scam going on. Mm. Everyone's trying to just slightly exploit or get the upper hand of the other guy. Uh, you have to find your allies very quickly. And, and in fact, the only time that, that, um, that dynamic was broken was when we had stowaways in Panama. And that's my most vivid memory of, um, it was almost like we'd had a, <laughs> we were living in a prison that had been broken in by prisoners. <laughs> And everyone was running around with cheese knives and, um, you know, just just uh, helmets on in case there was uh, some attack in the companion way. Wow. Yeah, I loved it. I, in hindsight, I loved it more. <laughs> and I, I will write about it. I haven't written about it yet. And I've only touched on it in, um, in Puzzled, but there's a, there's a whole book there waiting to be written. Were there many books on board? Uh, well, there were for me, yeah, but uh, <laughs> no, there was not a library. There was, there was a... Uh, a video library, and a lot of it was really cheesy. Um, but I had the collected works of Shakespeare and uh, 100, 100 Years of Solitude. I was going off to South America uh, and a few other books along those lines. Um, lots of he- I was into Hess- Herman Hess as well at that stage. What was your scheme or scam? Um, what was it? I suppose I was... Um, uh, I worked out. I worked out where the cushy jobs were because I, you have to work out where the blind spots are on the ship. And my scam was there was a painting job that you could do on the bow that was um, a kind of blindsided by all the big container stacks. So I thought all you had to do was be really efficient in your first hour, and then you could just basically lie in the sun for about you know for the next hour and a half. So when the um, uh, when your boss came along. If, even if he caught you in the sun, just you know, sitting there like a lizard, you could say, oh no, I've been really, really busy. And he might say, by, you know, by time ratio alone, yes, you have been busy and fair enough, you're having a break. <laughs> so I was hyper efficient and then hyper slack. <laughs> That's great. How long were you on board this ship uh, or these various Yeah, look, the whole, I said six months. It was probably more, it was three months and then I did, I did about another six weeks of shore work, which was nowhere near as fun because it didn't come with a view. Hmm. Calm seas, stormy seas? No, we had pretty stormy stuff. Uh, we dodged a whale, uh, which was pretty dramatic. 
uh, coming through the um, the Pacific side of um, uh, of, of Mexico, a big um, blue whale that we had to suddenly swerve and miss, hmm. and um, obviously the stowaways. We had um, you know stomach lurching seas um, in the Tasman and all our way to Singapore that really sorted you out early. Um, and uh, yeah, we also had some fairly. Um, there was a lot of um, uh, a lot of descent. It wasn't it wasn't a happy ship, mm. um, so it was it was a tough life. But yeah, you know, we had uh, shore leave in places like you know Kobe and Yokohama and New York and uh, and New Orleans, and uh, so you know there was the uh, there was this kind of little gringo grabs of time. Uh, where you could actually stop being a short, you know, a, a kind of a crewman. But um, I do remember my girlfriend saying, uh, "You're reading like a caveman." When I finally caught up with her in England, <laughs> because that's it. If you are in prison for for three or four months, you lose all your um, all your niceties around blokes too. Yeah, exactly. So I was pretty much eating with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, you should write about that. That'd be great. Yeah. I want to hear more about this, but we'll, we'll move yeah. on. Um, you did crosswords for Rolling Stone at some point? Or well, this is it. Stone? I mean, this is the beauty of crosswords. And why, I was, and why I've been so fastly you know, bound to them as a, as a vocation is because they do uh, come with so much flexibility. They allow you to be nomadic. And even though that's now a, uh, a presumption because of you know, social, uh, because of um, new media, you know, anyone can be a columnist anywhere uh, and file to any portal anywhere. But um, back then in the mid-80s, as they were, um, having a sustainable income while you were gallivanting around Guatemala was was next to inconceivable. Hmm. But that's what cr- Crosswords allowed me to have. How were you filing at that time? Uh, on a thing called airmail. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just putting them on onion skin paper and sending them to my beloved mother, who, because I, I, there was, I couldn't use telex or fax, she would then type them up, send them in, and I gave her, um, I think I gave her a, a pretty generous cut, <laughs> but nowhere near as fair, you know, for, for the labours that she uh, expended. <laughs> so you were a freelancer from, from the mid-80s onwards? I was. In fact, when, uh, just you reminded me, uh, I had a friend of mine who, a UTS uh, fellow graduate, who filled that role for about six months uh, when I did a second trip, filing stuff. And, I, you know, I gave him a wage. It was a, it was a legit second job for him too. But um, I, I then sacked him when I realised that he had been issuing a form letter to any people who were corresponding about puzzles or crosswords by saying, Dear Solver, get a life. Yours sincerely, word wit. <laughs> <laughs> Ruining your reputation. Ruining my reputation. <laughs> so he had to go. He's still a, a good friend, but I'd never work with him again. <laughs> <laughs> At what point did you realise you were a freelance puzzler? Oh, pretty much, you know, from about the age of 23. Is that how you identify yourself? If someone asked what you did? Yeah, I said I, I was a puzzle maker. Yeah. Uh, or probably then I would have said writer. Because I, I was much more earnest about writing, and I, I still say writer, but I think that's what word nerd or wordsmith does. It, it kind of covers all those bases. That I am a writer, and I am a puzzle maker, I am mm. a novelist, I am a you know nonfiction writer, I'm a kids writer, um, mm. I'm you know, I'm a freelance journalist. So anything to do with words is usually where I'm to be found. <laughs> yeah, clearly, it's wonderful. Mm. How did you go about making a living as a freelancer? How did you juggle various projects? Well, the pressure came on uh, when I came back uh, to, to, to settle down a little. Uh, got married in the early 90s. Still went off on a, uh, a harebrained plan to write a novel in the first year of marriage. Tracy, my wife, is a very understanding woman, clearly. <laughs> um, but then... Once kids came into the picture, which they eventually did, I then started thinking more critically about how to turn over more coin. And that's where uh, I, did, um, I did freelance copywriting. I actually you know, dabbled in ads for a while. Um, I ended up 
writing for local papers, um, which then turned into a um, writing for Inside Sport. So that thing that I was averse to or originally in love with became um, a really rewarding side career for about five years. Hmm. Uh, that bled into uh, sessional teaching at RMIT. So what I'm trying to paint for you is this um, uh, sort of so many strands you know I'm trying to weave some I, I kind of my career was so many strands just woven together and I, I think that's probably more of a realistic working model for so many people it's very uh, hard to imagine that you know you would have this monolithic career that is just in the one nest mm-hmm. where you do you know all things for the one company or in the one direction so yeah that's and I've been living off my wits and and uh, looking for new opportunities you know pretty much since uh, my son was born so that's sort of 20 years now hmm. mm. congratulations that's yeah oh, thanks it's it's something that is it comes quite naturally to me because I'm quite um I think I'm quite gorilla in my um, thinking and and also too I just I just feel very uncomfortable in a tie <laughs> you're a hustler by the sounds yeah hustler you're, are you good at selling yourself to new I am I am. I'm not um, necessarily good at um, taking knockbacks, uh, or I'm not necessarily good at um, being uh, clear-minded with a project when I'm under pressure. So that I do know my failings. I have to sort of watch myself there and try and give myself every chance to uh, to write a good piece or to to take a no. But I'm I'm very gregarious, and I don't mind. Um, getting in touch with someone yeah, circuitously if I think it could actually open an interesting door. Probably not as um, ambitious and driven as that might, um, as that may sound. There's something about me that is very much cruise control too. Hmm. What about negotiating for money? Are you good at that? I'm a lot better. And you know what? The, the secret is the, is the art of saying no. Um, and that's something I've, I've only come to learn probably in the last 10 years. Just when you realise that something is not worth doing for what you're being paid or not being paid, uh, is actually just stop doing it. Um, I think for the first 10 years of freelance life, I persisted doing it. But then I realised that if the if the money is not, um, you know, re- sort of a, a reflection of your labours, or it's not really advancing your skill set or your your own prospects, then it's starting to become a um, an albatross so let the let the albatross go mm-hmm. and I think by being a lot clearer about that has helped me realise my worth not in an inflated way but in a fair way I hope to think mm-hmm. and that uh, and by and large you know in people my clients have responded to it and I've lost some clients because uh, they haven't been they haven't met that um that paradigm but so be it I I'm better at letting things go than I used to be because when you're starting out like I was saying to you before we started recording I've been freelancing for six years and in the first few years like you don't want to say no to anything because you don't know a where it could lead or b where your next gig's coming from so that kind of um, anxiety or around just like oh they're asking me I'll say, I'll say yes mm-hmm. but yeah in the last year or two especially it's certainly been a case of pushing back and either dictating your own terms better or just saying no there's a thing called there is a thing called kind of work work karma i believe in it's if you think that a a job actually you have a sense like almost a sixth sense that it might lead somewhere really worthwhile um then go with it uh you know for a little while i mean it's to say flat no to a new client unless that what they're doing is you know quite exploitative then um I'm, i'm much more uh, adventurous. I do like to think that something new might lead somewhere interesting, but if it's the same old, same old for a, for a mega coin or for n- no sort of real enhancement of your um, skills or prospects, then it's a clear no. How did you enjoy ad copywriting? I thought I was going to enjoy it a lot more. Um, entering the field at 40, uh, not 21. Uh, I found myself doing a lot of direct mails and hardware catalogs. Uh, 
the best part of it was how ridiculously well paid it was. Yeah. Uh, that was not something I was used to. So suddenly when I was being able to charge $60 an hour, I thought, gosh, you know, that's, it made me realize that writing is not something that everyone can do. Yes. And that's a really important thing to realize. And that's something I try and, when I was teaching, I tried to tell students that because you're in a group of, a room full of 30 people and they can all write. That is nothing like what the street, uh, you know, it doesn't reflect the street mm. where you might get one in 30, one in 100 who can write. So what that $60 an hour reflected was you write a, a, a damn fine paragraph about orbital sanders. <laughs> Even though you don't know how they work, just keep it happening. Were you a freelance copywriter or did you work for one company in particular? Uh, I was freelance, but there was one company that was my main employer. Do you want to say who that was? Yeah, it was a place called Concept Center. Concept. I don't know whether they're still with us, to be honest. Hmm. Um, it was now about, how long ago? 17 years ago. So in the nature of things, they may have been amalgamated or flipped or been renamed. Were you ever the copywriter who did like slogans or that kind of marketing type thing? Yeah, I was... Um, I was hired uh, by, in fact, a really interesting job was converting uh, kind of opaque uh, insurance copy into lucid, clear copy uh, by a, a client who wanted that to happen as a point of difference. And mm. I found that that was a really interesting job, technical writing job. And the other job that I found interesting was it was a, um, a startup because the, this is, what year are we talking? Um, it is about 20 years ago, so let's say it's sort of 95, 6, uh, and the internet was just starting to make inroads, and there was a new internet um, company that was um, trying to uh, kind of connect all the services and, and uh, products of, and goods of, of uh, Melbourne. I well, won't name the company, but they wanted you know, a couple of smart flyboys on, on the job to come up with um, slogans for it. Uh, so that was really fun. It was me and this other guy who was the um, uh, the art director. We sat down for a you know like a, it was a drunken weekend in that classic advertising mode. I'm thinking this is what advertising should be like. And I don't think they they ran with one idea we came up with, but we were you know fairly paid for our for our drunken orgy. <laughs> when did you give that away? Copywriting. Uh, I think when um, when teaching opened up and and Sunday life opened up. Because I get, I got jaded with sports writing, I, and we'll um, come to that in a sec. Yeah, so then uh, I found myself there are only so many sports stories you can do, and I did. I became more and more interested in things like um, human interest and psychology and marketing. So that led naturally into a more magazine, a, a more a broader church that Sunday Life back then in the um, the early noughties represented. That was when it was a a really legit 3,000 word feature magazine mm. with Shelley Gear at the helm. And that was uh, a lot of fun and really, I, you know, had some great jobs through that magazine for about five years. Mm. Well, with Inside Sport, you, you realised that adolescent dream of becoming a sports writer. I did. Did you acknowledge that at the time? Like, wow, this is what I wanted to be. And were you excited before you started doing it? Uh, I think it's a, it's a bit like care for what you wish for, maybe. Because it was certainly a lot of fun, and I did. Um, uh, I think I wrote some some pretty good pieces that uh, were not your typical sports pieces. For example, um, you know, a Sydney to Hobart on deck, three thousand word piece oh, that right. you know was really kind of a white knuckle piece of writing. Did that help? Did uh, your previous ship life help you? <laughs> yeah, it did actually. And also having a father who was a sailor. Um, uh, that and that particular piece opened up. Um, opened up the door to the true crime book that I wrote because the the detective was um, reading that magazine you know who I co-authored the uh, crime book with one down one missing so that's what I'm talking about job karma and um, but I do remember the day that I actually quit sports writing um, it was when I was interviewing a guy called Darren Buick who was a um, a, a a very handy uh, goal sneak for Essendon, um, a kind of blood nut from um, from Perth, and I was interviewing him in his home, a little like you know we're doing here, 
And I said to him, it's such a strange coincidence that here you are playing for the Bombers, you live in the suburb called Airport, and your son's name is Jet, and the street you live on is Lockerbie Avenue. And he said, where's the coincidence? <laughs> and in my mind I say, I have to get off this bus. Uh, this is not me. Did you use that in the story? Any of that in the story? No, I didn't. But again, that's probably waiting for another. Maybe when my um, finally, when I get around to an autobiography, because that was I. You know how you talk about think about turning points. That was a turning point. Just the fact that he had such a. Um, I don't know. Just you know, if you're listening to this, Darren, I don't mean I don't mean ill, but there was this. Um, uh, there was a lack of intellectual uh, engagement with my remark, and made me think that I possibly could be broadening the. I could be spreading my wings. After that interview, did you go home to your wife and say as much? I think it percolated, but it then bubbled up pretty quickly. And then uh, <laughs> that's so funny. You were just like aghast that he couldn't make the connection. Well, not even one of them. You know, like even <laughs> even that your son is called Jet and you live in airport. Forget your name's Bomber and Lockerbie. But it was a it was a quadruple decker coincidence, and he could see none of it. So I thought, yeah, this is it. Time to move my, you know, time to move my caravan. Right. Into teaching at RMIT. Yeah, the, I think it was teaching. Uh, I, it's hard to actually put precise dates on it, but I think I may have been teaching at that stage anyway, um, or just starting to. And then, um, and that's probably really impelled me to push for um, broader freelancing, you know, horizons. And I think that Sunday life was pretty much closely followed by that incident. With teaching, had you any experience in this field? How did you approach the first? I did. Lessons? I was. An, I'm a natural teacher because yeah. uh, not look. I, I studied teaching. I did a dip ed. Um, uh, you know, kind of post grad one year course when I came back from travelling after um, a few years, thinking it could be that um, fall back career. Uh, only dabbled as a student teacher, but you know I do have a qualify. I do have a dip ed. Then that turned into a, a, a cert for university, you know, teaching level when that was required. And, you know, I just, I walked into the classroom like, um, like it was mine. I just, I really love teaching. Hmm. And I, I fell into TV by accident, but also quite naturally talking to a camera without notes because it's, it's like teaching, hmm. looking down the camera and explaining the origin of a word or, or what, you, what you had for lunch. It's the same thing. <laughs> Did you find it easy to follow the curriculum or to complete the assessment? Or to no, I, I'm not one for lesson plans. <laughs> I do like to think of a lesson on the, an hour before I walk into the classroom. Like my column a bit. Think, look around and what's happening and how can that turn into a lesson slash column. Um, and I think that's why my, I mean, I had a very, very low dropout rate. You know, I did actually um, excel at teaching and had some fantastic sort of um, 10 years at it and then again kind of it wore out its you know it's, it's used by date mm. just felt as though it was uh, if it was well paid that's the thing I would have stuck with it it wasn't mm. so the reward lay in the students and then after 10 years I felt as though it was time to give it to another another tutor did you find you were repeating yourself too much there were a couple of things that happened the pay was always getting squeezy the commitment of time, because if you're a freelancer, you don't always want to, you know, be fixed on a Tuesday afternoon teaching. It's nice to be more flexible. The TV came along, so that was a kind of, kid, you know, kidnapping career. And on top of that, journalism was changing so radically, media was changing so radically. I, I thought a lot of my lessons, a lot of my cautionary tales were, were kind of rooted in old media. So I thought it was probably time for a generational change as much as anything else. Mm. I mean, I think you'd be a terrific teacher because you're doing what you're doing. Um, I'm sure I could adapt into being a terrific teacher if I had to survive a little more robustly in new media. Um, I feel like I've established myself to a point that I'm a, um, where, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of, I'm fighting a, a battle from a position of comfort and advantage because I've actually worked hard to get you know, the, the kind of um, the mantle that I'm wearing. 
you know, it's it, it's not a it wasn't an overnight thing. But for someone just starting, throwing themselves into new media as a journalist, as a photographer, as a reviewer, then that's a different um, that's a different struggle. And to be able to encourage and equip that student, um, I'd have to upgrade my own skills to give them the the wherewithal. Mm-hmm. So all those things combined, it was time to make TV and write books and continue with Puzzle and then the column cropped up about the same year. So that's, I, I had this big shift. Yeah, clearly. Mm. Well, I'm touched you think I'd be a good teacher, but both my parents are teachers and I married a teacher, so I'm trying not to follow. Yeah, <laughs> well, let's, there you go. I did. I said I'd never be a teacher or a sports journalist, so <laughs> yes. you never know what life, is, indeed, indeed. what life holds. What was the TV gig? Uh, Letters and Numbers, it was called. Okay, and I, it was, I, I uh, never saw this. Yeah, it was a game show on SBS, and it was um, ran for about 18 months, and then it's currently on SBS now in, in repeat mode. And it's based on a, um, well, the UK game show called Countdown, which of course an Australian show could never name, mm. but you could never use that name. Yeah. It's a bunch of um, uh, uh, parlor games, really, where it's a, a series of anagram games. You, you're given a, a random bunch of letters and you have to try and find the longest word you can. And then likewise for the numbers game, you're given six numbers and you need to get a random total by using you know subtraction division um and uh yeah uh, you know top score wins so it was the uh it was a lot of fun and we were getting plenty of great um following feedback we're getting school groups in everything was looking rosy ratings were climbing but uh i'd say budget constraints and new management saw the show you know, getting the snip after about 18 months. So it was a bit of a blow, but uh, it was a lot of fun while it lasted. Were you involved in the writing of that? I did write my own uh, material for, I did a, a, an etymology vignette, we call them, every show, mm. where I just explain how the word companion and um, uh, uh, is related to the word mate. You know, one comes from bread, the other one comes from meat. <laughs> Uh, and then the other thing that I did was um, I wrote a series of books that were based on uh, the, I suppose what what letters and numbers did in many ways it was a even though it was short-lived it's been a wonderful uh, slingshot for my career as a writer and as a media player because my name and face are more recognizable despite the fact you you had no idea of the show <laughs> uh, it's a um, it does open a few more doors because of um, I was, you know, I am known, was known as uh, as the dictionary bloke or as the the guy with loud shirts or people at least recognise the name. So you well and truly came out of the shadows to have your face and name on TV. Well, that was that was that perfect storm I was referring to. Yeah, it was TV. It was the um, uh, and the books, that, which was that kind of my crossword confessional. Those two things in in combination were. Um, you know, really did uh, put the spotlight on me. Wow. So you've, yeah, you've, you've really had a grand swell of opportunities that have led into me, meaning you, right here, right now. Have there been, what have been some of the tough moments during those couple of decades in this piecemeal sort of freelance career? Uh, I suppose the fact that I haven't written fiction for about 20 years, that peeves me a little. And, and actually does uh, stick in my crawl because that was my first love, fiction writing. I think that made me realise that I'm actually better off uh, receiving a story uh, through, uh, you know, through research or through interviewing and writing up that story well. Um, that, that kind of highlights maybe a, a deficit in me as a writer and that does... Um, rankle me at times so I suppose that's one of my tougher moments and in fact it's nice to start as I'm doing at the moment getting back into fiction as a bit of uh, writing because I think I should I think it's overdue hmm. but the other the problem with that is I feel because now I'm established as being you know this one particular identity it's then challenging to present something quite um, you know uh, at odds with that so there, there's some little challenges and also to the whole I miss working in a team that was what the best part of um, the TV job was 
was actually turning up with you know this ensemble of of you know players and and producers and cameramen and sound guys and script writers and makeup girls and just uh, you know having a laugh getting getting down to making good you know good tv you know keeping the morale high i love that stuff mm. i just that's why i love sport it's probably why i loved um you know so much of things that i do I, you know, I like you know like parties i actually like being surrounded by people but when i work as a writer i need solitude mm. but because that means that i'm writing most of the time my life is largely solitary you know solitary so that can be i love my own company but i also get sick of it yeah right. i notice you've cut out a couple of crosswords yeah presumably from today's papers yep yeah, they're solved, and these are just uh, old ones that I'm going through. If I'm uh, at a loose end or in a place where the noise is a little bit uh, intrusive, um, instead of reading, I'll, I'll solve puzzles. Who, who else do you admire in this space? Uh, presumably you're happy with your own work as a, a puzzle maker, but who else in Australia is uh, at the top of the game? Uh, I'd, I'd say the I'd say the excitement lies in the next generation. There's um, I've got about uh, four people that I'm mentoring is too strong a word, but encouraging, looking at their puzzles occasionally and giving them some notes, trying to work their trying to work their stuff into mainstream. Uh, there's only so much I can do, and there's only so many opportunities available. But I'm excited at the prospect of what these compilers can do and could be. And overseas, I've got um, you know a lot of you know idols who just make fantastic crosswords. Um, I don't know if those names will mean much to to the listeners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me anything about the word penmanship that I might not already know? Yeah, okay. I'll tell you this: that pen relates to penne, which is feather. So because the pen was originally a quill, and that. A lot of, in the same way that pencil actually relates to penis. Um, but what people don't know is the word calamari um, is there's kalamos, which is, a, which is a reed. It's the Greek word for reed. And the kalamos was the originally what was used um, by the Egyptians for writing on papyrus. And what they used was for ink was squid ink. Mm. And that's why we, we call calamari. And it's actually related to the reed because of its um, the fact that it, it was that reed that it filled with its own ink. Wow. Mm. That's great. Yeah. Thanks for talking to me, David. No worries at all, Andrew. Thanks for listening to Penmanship and a thank you to my guest, David Astle. You can find show notes to this episode and all previous episodes at penmanshippodcast.com. On that same website, you can also subscribe to my weekly email newsletter named Dispatches, where each Thursday morning I send an email recommending great articles and podcasts I've recently consumed, as well as my own recently published writing. The theme song to this podcast, as ever, is Eternally Yours by Laughing Clowns. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Mm-hmm.